Hey, we're happy to invite back to the show, to have back on the show, to have starring on the show, Dr. James McGrath. Hi, Dr. McGrath. Hi. Uh, everybody, it seems every week, you have a limited budget, I have a limited budget. It's a crazy world out there, inflation, stagflation, whatever. I'm always telling you to go out and buy books. But if you if you stumbled across this video, if you're a fan, if you have an interest in the topic at all, you should go out and buy James's new book because uh, it's amazing, it's groundbreaking, it's cheap, it's readable, it's a pleasant 150-some pages. The, we have a lot of scholars on with scholarly books, which you should also get, and which you should also, if you can't afford order for your library, sometimes they're, they're not the most fun to read. This is a fun read, James. It's incredibly readable. And the, tell everybody the name of the book and where they can get it. We'll start right, right. there. Yeah, so the title is Christmaker, but I should have a copy and hold it up and stuff like that. It is A Life of John the Baptist. It's a biography, genuine biography of John the Baptist, something that a few skeptics have said could not be written, at least not a proper, well-informed, scholarly one. Hopefully, I've shown that it is indeed possible and have actually done it. And yeah, you can get it wherever books are sold. Uh, I would love it if you go into a, a local bookstore and ask them if they have it. And when they say no, if they do say no, indeed say no, say why not? But now I want to reiterate something that John said, tell your library about it, right? Most public libraries have a page where patrons can just very easily enter the, the details about a book and then they will get it. And then you can just check it out from them. And for the, the unaffordable scholarly books in particular, that's a great way of getting someone else to pay for it. And that does actually help scholars, right? Most of us write books as academics not because we're expecting to make a lot of money from them. Very few academic books really do. This one might. I mean, it seems to be getting a lot of attention, but, you know, mostly we want to help people think about things that we think are important, right? And so that's what I've tried to do in here and tried to make it readable. Yeah, tried to, tried to do it in a way that would actually just connect with a general audience. And maybe it's worth mentioning right off the bat that, for the first time with this project, I did something I'd never done before, which was to write two books simultaneously on the same topic. Yeah. And so there's a big scholarly book that's not this book that's coming out, or a version of this book that's coming out in October called John of History, Baptist of Faith. And that's a series of deep dives into some specific topics. Some of those topics are ones that I expect we'll talk about today, but this it is a biography. This was an attempt to paint the big picture, right? Tell the story of John. And I think there's, in addition to it being useful to talk to a general audience about these things, I think that's really important to do, right? Whether you're working on John the Baptist or Mary Magdalene or Jesus of Nazareth or Paul the Apostle or anybody else to not just dive deeply into the details and try and reconstruct some and answer unanswered questions and all that stuff, but also to say, how does this all fit together? And so... In the past, I've written books that were probably not ideally um, pitched for every reader. Let's put it that way. And this one, hopefully, I by separating out the, the general audience format and uh, the thing that would address them, hopefully I, uh, hopefully I did it this time. I, I, I think so. And we've recorded hundreds of shows. It's, it's become a, um, a twitch of mine where at the top of the show, I just repeat the same things I say. Then I point out the, that I'm repeating the same things I say. And now I'm pointing that out. So it's just going to get more and more meta, James. But uh, it, sometimes cliches are the best way to communicate, as sad as that is. So I, I am definitely using words groundbreaking, mind expanding, paradigm shifting to describe uh, this book, your research, what I'm expecting in the upcoming books and papers coming out of this research. I, it, it's, it's really, the folks, it, it's really all that. It's really all that and more. So the, we'll do our best to dive into it, but again, get the book. And I'll start with a question that I really hope that you answer with at least starting with a yes, because if it's a no, it's going to be a very short show. Which is, for many, John the Baptist is a footnote. Is he actually an important figure? You mean it's so tempting to say no, just to see what you would do. But yes, he is an important figure in his own right. But he's been overshadowed by those he influenced, as sometimes happens. There's a sense in which, you know, theologically at least, Paul and then Martin Luther or Augustine, or there are people who've come along after the inception of Christianity who have become the lens through which the entirety is perceived and interpreted, at least in certain circles. And 
in a sense, they have, their influence has overshadowed those who went before. There are people today in our very time who would claim to be followers of Jesus. And yet the things that they stand for seem like they are a world away from what Jesus stood for. And the, the overshadowing is something that happens and not just with John. But when we think about some of the things that I think are groundbreaking in this book, I think that I've connected some dots that haven't been connected before and show that John's influence is really much more extensive uh, in his time and in ways that continue to be felt today. And so there's his influence on Jesus. Some people at least are aware of that. Not everyone is aware that Jesus probably was John's disciple, but certainly well-informed people who are interested in the history of Christian origins will be aware of that. But I think I've also managed to trace his influence on the Judaism of his time in ways that impacted thing, events leading up to the Jewish war against Rome and the destruction of the temple, which shaped Judaism forever after. His influence on Gnosticism, right? I think I've actually cracked, and uh, there'll be much more about this in the big book, the, the question of the origins of Gnosticism in the circles around John the Baptist. Yeah. And if I'm right about that, even partly right, then that alone would make this pair of studies groundbreaking. But I think I've done more than just those couple of things. And so I think it's groundbreaking. But even if I turn out to be wrong about stuff, it's none of this is going to be boring. If you're interested in Christian origins, I've managed, I think, genuinely, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think I've managed to genuinely say some new things and make some new proposals about some well-worn topics. Absolutely. And that's just it, that there's a lot of new things in there. And, and that's one of the many reasons it's so exciting. And I don't know how you'd ever be proven wrong, but if we invent a time machine, then I guess we will know. And the people at home, they're watching, they're listening, and they're like, get to the Gnosticism, get to the Gnosticism, because it's a show called Talk Gnosis. It's in the middle of the interview, folks. So you'll just have to be patient, because we have to set a few things up first. Which is, of course, you said that this book is a, a biography of John the Baptist. So you even say in the book, obviously, we don't have any writings directly from him. We can't get into his head, even if we had writings from him. Our historical sources are not bi biographical by today's standards. But at the same time, you, you do a recreation of his influences and his influence. And you do paint a, a psychological picture of him at many points. So I was wondering in, in your book, if you could talk about how a vow his mother made actually set him to be in conflict with his father and this that helped shape his teachings. Yeah, and we may come back to uh, some more about this later because there are these in interesting connections with infancy traditions that including some sources that currently are not about John the Baptist, but may have some connections nonetheless and we may get back to that or you may bump, bump that question out earlier in this conversation but yeah so we have this depiction even in the gospel of luke that his he's dedicated uh, from before he was born like samuel and samson in the jewish scriptures or christian old testament to god as a nazarite right he's not to partake of alcoholic beverages it doesn't explicitly mention the hair but even just mentioning the never no, no touch of alcohol is enough to indicate, oh, it's that kind of vow, right? People who are familiar with the scriptures would have gotten that. And that actually allows us to figure something out that is, you know, has puzzled people. And that's one of those places where I notice I, by spending a whole, full year just basically thinking about nothing other than John the Baptist, notice some things that we'd all miss, uh, which is one of which is that you can't be a lifelong Nazarite which means never cutting your hair, and be a priest, which requires keeping your hair trim, right, according to the scripture. And so if John had a priestly heritage on his father's side, and this is something that's there in the infancy traditions, but would have been generally known about him and his family, and if he never cut his hair and people could see he was a Nazarite, that's also something that is not just mythic infancy story stuff, it's the kind of thing that people would have been able to see about John, then we have right there a tension. And the fact that a vow that was made before he was born might have kept him from pursuing his father's vocation, as it were, and the one that should have rightfully been his, might have been the thing that sent him back to the scriptures and to discover that there was this sort of counter narrative running through it, where you have people like Samuel, who's he's like very much in the image of Samuel in a lot of ways, as Luke tells the story. And Samuel's offering sacrifices 
in places other than Jerusalem. Of course, the temple hasn't been built yet, but Samuel is not a priest. And so you get this complexity, right? And this diversity of perspective in the scriptures. And John's awareness of limitations of Torah, something that I think influences Gnosticism. And hopefully people didn't actually skip this part and go right to the halfway part looking for the Gnostic stuff because I, it connects up earlier too. But also the, you know, the offering of baptism for the forgiveness of sins as an alternative to what the temple offered and a, a cheaper option, right? A free option required time and dedication and seriousness, but didn't require financial cost. And this probably didn't tra involve travel to a distant locale the way offering a, a sacrifice in the temple in Jerusalem did. And so I think that that vow, if there's some historical basis for it, and it's the kind of thing that would have been visible about John, right? And so I think there's a reason, unlike a lot of infancy narrative stuff, to think this might actually have something, this might be telling even if it's a fictional infancy story or multiple fictional versions of the story of John, they may be based on what was known about him. And in this case, I think we have a good reason to think that might be the case, especially when pulling on these threads allows us to get a glimpse inside John's mind. What might have led him to do this thing that nobody else had done before that made the impact that it did on Jesus and then on Christianity and on Judaism and on Gnosticism and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. You can really see how it would have sent him into kind of an existential crisis. And as you said, he turns to the scriptures where, okay, wait a minute, actually, there's some contradictions in here. Or if he didn't see them as contradictions, there's alternate paths. But so you mentioned the temple. You mentioned that he couldn't be a temple priest because of this conflict. What does John's possible issues with the temple have to do with the baptism that he offered? Yeah, baptism for the forgiveness of sins, right? The fact that this is known as John's baptism, the fact that his authority to baptize is challenged, the fact that this whole thing is associated with him in that way makes it clear that this is not a purity immersion. This is not something that was already widely practiced in his time. And it's offering for free what the temple was offering at a cost. And it was potentially, right, if he's sending people out to proclaim this, Luke's gospel says that he was proclaiming it. And we the fact that even if people were coming to him in certain places to, to actually hear him speak, he must have been sending people out. There's no other way to get your message to spread. And so presumably his baptism is being practiced in other places. It's spreading as well. And forgiveness is going to where people are. And in a time when either in Jerusalem or if you were Samaritan, then there was a temple on Mount Gerizim, but there was still this sense that access to the divine presence, direct access to the close proximity of God and to forgiveness were locked into particular places, were mediated by priestly authorities. And John shows up as this prophetic figure claiming to have the authority to offer something else. And that gives us a lot of clues about what his baptism must have been like, but also I think, again, confirms just the extent to which he was doing something radical in his time. Yeah, absolutely. Can you tell us a bit about John's teachings on community and justice and how they may have affected his disciple, Jesus? Yeah. So one of the things that my books on John the Baptist explore is the fact that we can use Jesus as a source of information about John. And that's another one of those things that once I started doing it, I was like, how did we miss this for so long? Because, And the answer is obvious, right? Everybody who comes to John the Baptist by way of Christianity, which is most of us, right? our encounter with John comes by way of Christianity, hear John on the pages of the Christian Gospels saying, don't pay attention to me, pay attention to Jesus. And so we move quickly past him, giving him a quick glance to see if doing so can tell us anything about Jesus right? that we wouldn't otherwise have gotten. If we reverse the direction of our interest and pay attention to Jesus with a view to saying, John was an influence on Jesus. There was a lot of continuity. We hear some of the same turns of phrase, even in some of our sources, being used by both. What does close look at, a close look at Jesus tell us about John? And I think that what we see is a lot of continuity. He expects there to be some kind of major upheaval that will shake things up even more dramatically than his baptism is doing. He is calling for justice, right? And he's challenging people to do what's right within the framework of a system that is woven through with injustice. And 
one thing that we get in early Christianity and in Mandaism, among those people who consider themselves followers of John the Baptist to this very day, is an emphasis on nonviolence, as well as an emphasis on social and economic justice. And so there's a call to not use the fact that you don't have a means necessarily to completely overhaul the system, which would, would have potentially required, you could do it slowly, and I think you may have hoped that would happen. But to change it radically instantaneously, or to try to, means basically taking up arms. And usually by the time you're done staging a violent revolution, you've become the next terrible dictator and <laughs> replace them. And so John has this vision of people just doing what's right within the purview of their own sphere of influence and calling them to do that. Not in a way that's opposed to uh, having a communal impact, but in a way that says, yeah, every single, in unless every single individual does this within their own sphere of influence, then we're not going to have that kind of wider change um, until that time when perhaps God brings it about miraculously. But he wasn't just waiting around for that. Yeah. So I, I think already some people have noticed a, a few things that, that might be confusing because we I mentioned uh, and you mentioned Jesus being his disciple. We mentioned him sending people out into the wider world with with his baptism. But but wasn't John a hermit who lived in the desert next to a river of no community and people would just go to him? They'd get the dunk, get rid of their sins, and go back to their day to day lives. That, that's a common perception, and I would want to say misperception. I think that if John had been a hermit, then the extent of his influence, perhaps you could explain it by appeal to the miraculous, but historically speaking, would be even harder to understand. The book of Acts says that when a Jesus-focused message involving baptism reaches places like Asia Minor, there are already followers of, there are members of the way, which seems to have been a name first and foremost for John's movement, from which Christianity emerges, who were already there. Right. Paul is preaching at Ephesus and it's like finds disciples there. Right? Who are these disciples? They've been baptized with John's baptism. And so that gives us a, a hermit doesn't have that extent of influence. And so I think we need to situate John's wilderness at the crossroads, right? At the places where you reach people. And between that and sending people out, I think he is really trying to transform society. And I think that's a good way of framing it. He's he has a vision for Israel, right? And I think he realized that you have these competing temples that are dividing the historic northern tribes from the tribe of Judah and those that became part of the, the, the kingdom of Ju Judah and of Judea. And, of, and you have these opposing traditions with separate places of worship that are part of the competition. Mm -hmm. And he really wants to bring people together and sees this as a potential for doing that. And so I think there's a sense in which he had a vision. He didn't want to make yet another sectarian group whose vision was, we'll just get this small number of righteous people together and then God will see it and bless us. And then by way of that, maybe everyone else will be destroyed in the, the fires of judgment, but you know, there'll be, we'll be this tiny remnant. Paul seems to have genuinely wanted to reach the whole and to transform the whole. And often reformers start out that way. And then what, emerges after them is in fact a whole bunch of sects right yeah. and i think that's probably what happened in the case of john as well right that we get christianity and we get both christian and non-christian versions of gnosticism emerging we get a samaritan movement that seems to not have been gnostic but involved praying in uh, water that was associated with uh, one of john's disciples we get a whole bunch of things going on i think and so I think that John didn't create an organized movement, and many of those who followed him and who looked up to him tried to do so in ways that splintered the thing that John, I think, at least in ideally had hoped to hold together. What does the Lord's Prayer have to do with John? The Gospel of Luke says that the request that um, led to Jesus sharing that prayer, teaching that prayer to his, his followers, was a request that said, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples how to pray. Yeah. And Jesus being a disciple of John's, that could have meant, you know, so you heard John, so pass on to us his prayer. You know, yeah. As close to the exact words as you can remember. It's not necessarily that. I think I'd be more than satisfied saying this is the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples as 
Jesus himself being a disciple of John. And so it's something that comes from John, perhaps one step removed. I don't want to say that Jesus didn't contribute anything to it. That's certainly not uh, something that the evidence would necessarily sustain. The truth is we don't know, but the way the question is framed in Luke, as well as the, the fact that we have this background just behind almost every single petition in the Lord's Prayer, there is something to do with the wilderness. And that symbolism is, I think, also interesting. And if we if we want to psychologize uh, John the Baptist, uh, especially with his priestly father and not following his father's footsteps, if anyone was going to turn to God as the heavenly Abba to <laughs> make up for something that didn't go uh, the way it might have ideally in the human realm, then uh, I think it's easier to do that in the case of John in some ways than it might be for Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And again, that passage in Luke, that is a, a possible reading, I, I would say, argue perhaps an even more literal reading of it. That is the exact prayer that comes from John the Baptist. But as you said, it could be Jesus' summation of John's thought upon him. Yeah. And uh, quickly, just because you brought it up, because it is an idea that's out there that Jesus was unique in referring to God as Abba, as father, of having this father-son relationship. But it is something that, that is found in the Jewish scriptures, right? That both him and John are, are pulling on a thread, one of the many threads that they're, that they're pulling on into their teachings. It is. And one of the things that's going to be a whole chapter in the bigger book that's coming in October on prayers of John the Baptist. And so it digs into the Lord's Prayer and what the connections with John might be in a way that Christmaker also does a little bit, but also looks at some of the kinds of things that mostly, you know, mostly or only scholars are going to be interested in. Things like Syriac prayers prayers from the Aramaic-speaking Christian tr tradition, and they have prayers in their tradition, in compilations of prayers that are labeled things like the prayer that John the Baptist taught his disciples. Oh. And they start with either Father or Holy Father, right? In Aramaic, Abba. So in Syriac, it's Abba, right? It's the same word. And it's the phrase that you get either in the Lord's Prayer, right, in Aramaic, or what we get in the prayer attributed to Jesus in John 17, right, where you get the, it's like Holy Father, right? And so clearly this tradition is aware by whatever means has kept alive a memory somehow that the way you'd expect John to pray is how Jesus prayed, right? And that I think tells us something, right? That that, that was not entirely forgotten. Uh, and so even when that tradition tries to turn the prayer and re-envisage it, so we get versions of it in which it's, Father, show us your son, reveal to us, turn our attention, turn our eyes upon Jesus, to quote the, the uh, popular song. In the process of doing that, we still see a glimpse of a tradition that remembered that the way Jesus prayed was how John had taught his disciples to pray. And I don't think it's necessarily, it's, I, I don't want to exclude the possibility that we, we are indeed getting John's prayer uh, just passed on by Jesus. I don't want to overstate the evidence scholars do this and are careful. <laughs> and there's one scholar in particular who's a friend of mine who's made a strong argument against that. I'm, I, so this is my effort to stay friends with him. Listeners, decide for yourselves. <laughs> I, I guess I want to preface this question a little bit because there's a, a very bad idea that comes from a legacy of anti-Judaism, anti-Semitism, bad readings of, of the Gospels, although I guess there is a little bit of this, this content in, in the Gospels, but that, that people like like John, Jesus, Paul, that they were religious innovators who were opposed to the Judaism of their time. Very bad idea. When in fact, and I don't actually use the term Judaism for the, but I'll use it for Second Temple Hebraic religion, Second Temple Israelite religion. I'll pick of something, James. But it, this was very diverse, right? We had these groups of, of uh, the different sects, different Jews, different Jewish thinkers who were arguing with each other, agreeing with each other, having all sorts of thoughts and theological ideas, exchanging ideas. And Paul, Jesus, and John were part of this mosaic. And some of their ideas are unique, and some of them are uh, definitely are not. So I, I just want to put that preface in there. Maybe you can talk a little bit about it for, for this next question, which is how did John's thoughts on Torah and inspiration from the prophets possibly get passed down to Paul and inspire Paul to bring Gentiles into the people of Israel? Yeah, there's. we could ask about to use examples from within Christianity, because I think that sometimes helps people think about figures like John and Jesus and even Paul within Judaism more helpfully. Was John Wesley anti-Anglican? Was Martin Luther anti-Catholic, right? And 
it it would be possible to for some to say, oh yes, absolutely, because what they tried to do broke the tradition and set some people off into something that became a separate religious tradition. And you know, you can say that with hindsight, but at the moment they are an example of the potential diversity within that tradition. And of course, there are some who will define any tradition, whether it's Judaism or Christianity, whether it's Protestantism or being Southern Baptist or Methodist or United Methodist or whatever it is, or being Johannite Gnostic in a way that attempts to say, yeah, if you go that route, you can't be part of this tradition, right? You're stepping beyond it. And th I think there should be, you know, I think ultimately there are boundaries, right? In the sense that often, you know, there are things that you could do where you might still claim the label Christian, and yet you look so unlike anything that Jesus could have ever <laughs> consented to that it's, okay, as a Christian myself, I want to argue that you really should not be using that label, right? But ultimately, there's no way to settle those debates, right, in any given moment. And sometimes when people are trying to define the tradition very narrowly, they are excluding others that belong to be, deserve to be part of it. And so what became Jewish orthodoxy with some time Right, not necessarily meaning Orthodox Judaism in the modern sense, but as Judaism developed an Orthodoxy in ancient times, it excluded some things, including Christianity, but not just Christianity. Right? It's interesting that, and not just like the writings of Flavius Josephus, but also a lot of ancient Jewish literature that and was either mystical in orientation or some of the Enochic stuff ends up being preserved more by Christians than in the Jewish mainstream. Right. And so I think that what we need to see is that John was digging deep into some roots that were at least firmly rooted in the Israelite tradition. And I think he was, he saw himself as actively, first and foremost, stepping into the role of prophet as we find it in figures like Amos and Jeremiah, right? And not to mention Elijah, right? After whom he seems to have styled himself and Samuel. And on the other hand, he's recognizing that what's become Judaism as we, or the, the religion of Judah and what's become Samaritanism and a, ver a variety of other things that you know, are not welcome in either of those all have roots in this Israelite tradition. And I think that there was probably an uncomfortable diversity in this movement, right? Because the way it splinters suggests that John was bringing together uh, some people that would not have naturally gotten along. And it would be fascinating to explore, for instance, and try to figure out, did Jesus's view of Samaritans develop over time? Because we have you know, some things that are quite dismissive. We also have a Samaritan as a hero of a parable, famously. We have a, what I think is a very transformative conversation with a Samaritan woman you know, in the Gospel of John. And it's possible that it, as part of John's movement, Jesus, the Galilean of mostly at least half uh, Judean ancestry and maybe some ancestry from northern Israelite tribes, given where he was located, we don't know. But at the very least, identifying himself as Jewish, as connected with the religion of Judea and its scriptures and its perspective, uh, he may have encountered some people that John roped into his movement that were up in Samaria. And I suspect that there were some, there were some arguments as they gathered around the campfire. And I, I sometimes wondered if, you know, this wouldn't have been something that would have happened in a, a coffee house or something like that, right? Where you have the great thinker who brings together a whole bunch of disciples who don't all see eye to eye, but gather around this great, influential, charismatic figure. Yeah. If John's movement had had coffee. Well, they would have been able to stay up even later around that uh, campfire as well. So more um, baptisms moving faster. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, we better get to the people are like, uh, get to the Gnosticism. Get to, so, so we have a couple of questions here for the Gnostic section. We had you talk about the Mandeans uh, here on the show. I'm going to link that in the show notes. Uh, many scholars, they don't think that there's historical data about John or his teachings in their scriptures, in their religion, in their practices. So why do you use them, James? Yeah, great question. And that's one of the reasons why there's a bigger book coming is because I knew that you know, I could tell the story of John in the way that I was starting to reconstruct it. But there are questions of, of not just of specific points of interpretation, but of method that you know, would be contested. And so there's a chapter dedicated to can we use Mandian sources? And one of the examples I use in making the case that the answer is yes 
is to look at the Nagamati sources, right? Mm -hmm. If we didn't have the very unusual privilege as historical scholars to have very early sources about Jesus of Nazareth, then we could look at sources like those. And just the Gospel of Thomas alone, we know from the Synoptic Gospels that a lot of what's in there was written much earlier and was around much earlier. And so we'd be looking to sources from a few centuries later saying, maybe these can give us a glimpse and help us to reconstruct. Since we don't have that early of a, a Gospel of John the Baptist kind of thing, we need to bring in some of these later sources. And most of the scholarly view of Mandaean sources today is dismissal based on hearsay and unfamiliarity, right? So there has been a trend and it's, we can understand how it came about, but it's not an appropriate one, right? It's not based on critical argumentation, examination of the source, relevant sources, anything like that. I'm one of few New Testament scholars that has done some of that kind of work directly on Mandaean sources, has collaborated with a linguist to do a translation, but also done some analysis of when is the language of these texts from and things like that. And the idea that sometimes gets repeated that, well, maybe they borrowed John from Christians in order to get in with Islamic authorities, just not at all plausible. Right? And so what happened, just to, for those who are interested in the history, we had this uncritical use of Mandaean sources by a generation of scholars that was followed by a pendulum swing to an uncritical dismissal. And what I am advocate for in the bigger book, but also try to exemplify in the biography, is that we can use these sources critically and carefully and recognize they are later, right? We can't just treat them as though they tell the story of John as people were telling it in John's time, but we can search them for evidence of traditions. We can use them to triangulate back on John's impact and use them in those historically appropriate ways. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, keeping on with, with the Gnostic section. So you, you mentioned that these different people from perhaps different sort of sects might be an appropriate word, maybe not, uh, sitting around the campfire with John, right? And sitting around with perhaps other disciples of John. So how might have John's teachings and contact with some Second Temple Judaic groups who had different perspectives on Second Temple Judaic religion lead to Gnosticism? And they may have been Second Temple in the sense that there was a time when the Second Temple was standing, but how they viewed the temple may be one of the ways that they were diverse, right? There was a fair amount of criticism raging from the, the group at Qumran saying, we'd love to get back there, but they need to get their act together and do things the way we say they need to be done first, right? Yeah. And then I think there were others who were detractors who you know, had actually resisted in some out-of-the-way places the imposition of monotheism itself and of Torah. Right. And they reflected something of that ancient Israelite polytheism that pops up. We get glimpses of it through the Jewish scriptures, but we get it from archaeology. But we also know that at least until around the fifth century BC, there was a temple in Egypt where it sounds like that Yahweh was worshipped together with a consort and it reflected some of this ancient religion. Mm. And because Mandaean sources have been treated as late or have been ignored by scholars interested in Gnosticism, what's been missed is that we have in them this unique resource of a form of Gnosticism that is native to an Aramaic-speaking environment, and so a Semitic linguistic environment. And so whereas some scholars looking at the Nagamadi stuff have said, this kind of looks like the sort of stuff that might have been part of ancient Israel's tradition and be this fringe stuff, this stuff that doesn't create orthodoxy. But in the Mandaean sources, we actually have these names that sound like pre-exilic Israelite ways of talking about the divine, ranging from uh, Yorba, Yah, Roba, Yah the Great, uh, Yah Shemaim, you know, Yoshimim, uh, to Anat He, which is Anat of life. We get Anat Yahu being worshipped at Elephantine in Egypt, that temple I mentioned. And so the fact that for such a long time, up until just a matter of decades ago, there was still this assumption that there was this thing called Jewish orthodoxy that had always been normative and that anything else was a departure from that. Yeah. And what scholars have found working on ancient Israel is that actually monotheism probably came about relatively late in their history and was revolutionary. Yeah. 
And if we look at where Gnosticism first emerges, or not not necessarily where it first emerges, but where we see it, the, like we catch glimpses of it first appearing into a public view, shall we say, then it's the kinds of places that we know there were Israelite diasporas, Egypt, Mesopotamia, Samaria, Transjordan, and yet there are also places where you would have had less early and perhaps less influential control from those promoting this vision of Jewish orthodoxy that involves Torah and monotheism. And so I suspect that John in the wilderness and is you know, intersecting with people in the out of the way places and pe members of his group coming from there and going back to there, that it reaches people who've kept alive this tradition and that it's that that leads to Gnosticism, right? That it's his sort of mystic, the mystical aspect of his teaching about baptism together with this. Now, one thing I can't answer is whether John the Baptist himself was comfortable with that level of diversity, right? Did he yeah. know just the full range of views that were being held by people in his movement? Possibly, right? I'm not saying that he didn't. There, there are limits to how much we can get inside John's mind, but it's at the very least to his credit that his movement certainly deliberately brings together Judeans, Samaritans, Galilee, urban, rural, brings together some very well-educated people, but from all those diverse backgrounds. And they produce vibrant movements that become each sort of a separate religious tradition in its own right, and sometimes multiple ones. So some of these groups, some of these thinkers were connected to this older current that, that's pre-Torah, pre-monotheism. They're looking at what's going on and maybe literally or satirically, they're creating scriptures, telling stories where, you know, actually that God that they're worshiping is not, is, is not the be all end all. Is that right? That's starting to circulate in their minds. Yeah. Yeah. And so the key thing that gets imposed with this sort of monotheistic revolution in ancient Israel is that the one creator God is viewed as the only God that you can legitimately worship. And the question that's puzzled scholars for, since time immemorial, as long as they've been asking, how does Gnosticism come into existence as a historical phenomenon? You know, the puzzle is that if you don't like the God that creates in Genesis and you are Jewish, that how do you even not like this God that's you know, in your scripture? Yeah. And if you are not part of the Jewish tradition, then why would you bother saying this about the Jewish God, right? The Jewish creator, because it's very specifically the God who creates in Genesis that's in view in the, not the Gnostic scriptures that we have. And so if you're part of the Israelite tradition and are tr you, you've kept alive something that now they're saying, nope, you can't have that. Nope, you've got to do it this way. Nope, you've got to exclude all of that other stuff. And you're far enough from the kind of authorities that can impose that in any kind of really forceful way or where it's numerically dominant, then you can develop a countercultural tradition, right? A counter reading of the narrative that, you know, envisages these other divine figures from above when the, the creator says, I am, and there is no other. And the voice comes from above is like, you know, you blind God, what do you know? And things like that. And I think that this, in addition to matching some, what we find in the Mandaean sources, those names, those divine epithets also makes historical sense in a way that other proposals have not. And yeah, that's one of the many things about this project that's just got me excited. I'm really looking forward to seeing how scholars working on Gnosticism respond to this proposal. Yeah, I, I'm excited as well. Okay, continuing on then with the Gnostic section, I'm going to ask a question, which is, what were some of the ideas about a heavenly double and, and how might they have been influential on John? And some people who know the Valentinian material right now, they're, they're perking up with that question. So if, if you could, if you could tell us about this, this idea of heavenly doubles. Yeah, so the something that we find, it's, it's clearly earlier and broader than John, right? Um, we can trace it back. But something that flourishes in the traditions that we know of as Gnosticism, uh, flourishes in Manichaeism, which uh, embraces a fair amount of Gnosticism, uh, seems to emerge out of a baptizing Christian group called the Elkisites that were closer to John the Baptist than the developing mainstream of Christianity. Uh, a lot of these traditions have this element, and there's a great book called Our Divine Double that really digs into this in a lot of detail that people might be interested in. Another one to recommend to your public library if you don't want to get it yourself. And it's in the footnotes in my books about the Baptists as well in relevant places. But people 
had this sense that there was a, a heavenly counterpart, right? And we get that in various places. Book of Daniel with its idea that there are heavenly counterparts to earthly kingdoms and a heavenly son of man, one this human figure that somehow represents and is connected with the saints of the Most High on earth. And Manny, who starts Manichaeism, is a really interesting case because he has an experience in connection with baptism, right? sees this reflection in the water and gets this glimpse of this figure that he recognizes as his divine double. And I really wonder about that, whether on the one hand, that gives us a, a sense of what John might have experienced, yeah. having a glimpse in the water and getting a sense that this, you're getting a glimpse of not just a reflection of your earthly self, but also something more. Yeah. And perhaps saying, seeing something and saying, Elijah, there's this other, and connecting it with those traditions in scripture that somehow Elisha could have a portion of the spirit of Elijah, that one figure could connect with the spiritual celestial counterpart of another figure yeah and if that's the case then it would explain why we get this in traditions that emerge from around john sometimes up one or two steps removed manny i think stamps out baptism in his movement not least because probably doesn't want anybody else <laughs> claiming to come along as the definitive last apostle <laughs> um, having a similar experience uh i'm not sure i don't know the manichaean tradition well enough to know whether that's uh, a likely motive or not it is the kind of thing that sometimes religious leaders do, though. But it would also explain some of these things, questions about who is Jesus? Is he John the Baptist? And in what sense could he be John the Baptist? Is he one of these other figures? And so I think that what sometimes it's called doppelganger mysticism, right? Or mysticism that involves not just encounter with a celestial reality, not just a spiritual experience, but a sense that you've connected with a celestial counterpart to yourself, right? And it does seem like there, there are a number of threads that all connect back to John the Baptist uh, that have this as a feature, which might suggest that goes back to John as well. Uh, not necessarily unique to him or starting just with him, but that it was something that characterized the kind of spiritual experience that maybe he hoped that people would have if they underwent his baptism. Some scholars think that the cleansing of the temple, or as you call it, Jesus' temple tantrum, actually led to Jesus' death. But why might it have instead been a, a factor in, in John's death? Yeah, that might not. this might not be an either-or. Certainly could have got Jesus' road to where he eventually ended up. But I think that if we look closely at the Gospel of John in particular, then Jesus carries out that action in the temple at a time when John is not yet imprisoned, and so Jesus is still part of John's movement. And they even mention a specific number of years that the temple's been under construction, which would suggest that timing, right? Mm -hmm. And so if Jesus did that, this as part of John's movement, then that would have been the kind of thing that might have gotten the authorities more interested, right? And we actually have this intriguing reference in uh, the historian Flavius Josephus, who mentions Herod Antipas imprisoning John, eventually executing him because of concern for the way that John was gathering crowds and the crowds seemed willing to do anything that he might advise them. And if Jesus did this as part of John's movement, then that's the only specific thing we know of somebody doing at John's behest. And it would make sense that would worry not just the authorities in Jerusalem, where the temple was, but also Herod Antipas and the neighboring territories who really would like to be the king in Jerusalem as well, and <laughs> kept asking the Romans to make that happen. And if he's going to have any hope of that, then he's got to stamp out unrest in his own territory, as well as a potential threat to the place that he wants to uh, hopefully one day rule over as king and not just tetrarch of neighboring territories. And so it may be that Jesus' action in the temple as an emissary of John and his movement might have led to John the Baptist being arrested and eventually executed. And that in turn, I think, may have led Jesus to realize that his own path might have to be more similar to John's, right? Because some thought that the one who is to come that John spoke of, that John's movement as a whole needs to be doing something, you know, it's, it can't just be stamped out and killed. And John's death was probably very traumatic for that movement. Jesus steps forward, right, according to the Synoptic Gospels, starts regathering and regrouping the disciples of John. And 
people would have been hoping, okay, he'll do something different than, you know, what happened to John won't happen to him. And so the whole connection between the two may have provided this movement with resources to cope with the death of both John and of Jesus and to reinterpret the meaning of the movement in light of that. Yeah. So I have so many more questions. I had to delete a couple, but because, but I'll ask them when we have you back on when the scholarly book comes out. I keep saying scholarly book, but this is also a scholarly book, but it's readable and fun. But yeah. the other one talks about Syriac sources. And so, <laughs> yeah, unless that's your idea of fun, then yeah. Christ, we have to relate John the Baptist is the one that you want to pick up. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of my personal idea of fun. <laughs> but okay, so it's everybody knows that the Christmas story is borrowed from the legends of Horus. And I, I'm kidding. So we're actually recording this on the nativity of St. John. It's the national holiday of Quebec where I live. Can you tell us about uh, some of your theories that some of the well-known Christmas stories might actually be borrowed from stories that were originally told about John? Yeah. So the thing that is perhaps most obvious to the, the people who have come by way of Christianity is that in the Gospel of Luke, we have some infancy stuff related to John. And you know, where did Luke get that? Did he just invent it? Did he get it from followers of John the Baptist? There's this distinctive style of those early chapters, and it's there's that. Mm -hmm. And scholars have long thought that there might be something more behind it. Those of us who pay attention to the Mandaean sources know that in the Mandaean book of John, which is has a central section focused on John the Baptist, has infancy traditions that feature uh, Zachariah and Enishbi, their versions of Zechariah and Elizabeth, but very different stories, right? And yet enough points of intersection that, hey, did they get this from Luke's gospel? And in the big, the bigger book is coming, there's a, a detailed look at the evidence that's not what happened and that it reflects some influence of traditions that go back earlier than Luke. Now, there's also a work known as the Infancy Gospel of James. And at the end of that, it seems it may have, at the very least, a fragment of an infancy story about John because Herod's sent people to slaughter infants in Bethlehem. And the last mention we get of Jesus and his family is that his parents hide him in a manger, right, when the killing is going on, which is itself interesting. It's like, wait, flight to Egypt, anyone? So, yeah. And then suddenly... We're, the rest of it is focused on John the Baptist. That's, and Elizabeth knew that they were searching for John. That's like, wait, they're searching specifically for John? When did this happen? This is about the story. And so the way of treating that up until now has been as a fragment of a, a John the Baptist narrative, yeah. which is very strange because why would you tag this on at the end? Yeah. Where's the rest of the story? Because it starts abruptly. And so the case I make, and this is going to be part of some papers I'll be giving uh, very soon, but the case I make in the big book but there's a whole chapter about the infancy stuff. And I started that chapter thinking, yeah, could we, we're not going to get back behind the Gospel of Luke and the Mandaean source and get the reconstruct the infancy story that you know, sort of predates all of them. And actually, I think we can, at least in its broad outlines. Because what I realized looking at this is I think it's better to make sense of that last bit of the infancy gospel or proto-evangelium of James. Not as a bit stuck on, but as... Uh, representing what we call editorial fatigue. Mm -hmm. When you're working with a source, sometimes as you get towards the end of using it for a particular story or something like that, you start to you know, include things that actually don't fit things you said earlier where you had changed. Right? Editors get tired, in other words. And so I think that that might be a source that the author of the Infancy Gospel of James has been transforming all along. And then we go back to the beginning and look again. It's, oh, maybe... The parents of Mary, who here are called Joachim and Anna, maybe the reason they look so much, not just Hannah and the parents of Samuel from Old Testament, but like John's parents from the Gospel of Luke, is because this author, this Christian author, has taken a story about John and his parents and transformed it to be about Mary. And suddenly, when you consider that possibility and then look at that in relation to the Mandaean stuff and in the stuff that's in the Gospel of Luke, Suddenly there are these connections, right? Bits that are puzzling in the fragmentary versions and the piecemeal usage of this in each of these, that when we connect them, make more sense than each of these does on its own. And so I was persuaded, despite having started from a significant amount of skepticism and expecting to argue against this, that it actually is possible to uh, not construct in detail, like the exact words or anything like that, but to construct the outline of an infancy story. 
And so there's not constructing, reconstructing underlying sources using obscure texts that a lot of your listeners will be like, oh yeah, we know all of these texts, right? <laughs> but the average person doesn't. So I didn't put that in Christmaker. And plus I didn't want a, a hypothetical reconstruction to be part of how people are judging what I say about John and his parents and his family. But in the bigger book that's coming, you know, I'll dig into some of that. And I think that when you realize that there we get explicitly, right, the parent, the parents of Mary in the infancy gospel actually do basically dedicate her, right? And say, it's Mary's mother saying, this child I will dedicate. And so the thing that we don't get ex as explicitly in Luke, but it's implied, mm -hmm. is explicit there. And if that was originally about John, it's a Christian author transforming material that was originally about John, then that's yet another piece of this puzzle that suddenly comes together. Yeah. The, the Possibly the two most famous prayers, maybe this is arguable, in Christianity are, are the Lord's Prayer and the, the Magnificat. Which, which some people associate with with the Christmas season, with with the Christmas story, which is a, a prayer that 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 Mary gives early on in Luke, right? And is, is it true that in some versions of Luke, this prayer is actually uttered by John the Baptist's mother? Yes. So we get that in it's in some Latin manuscripts, and so it's 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 early enough that it's okay. There's probably something in Greek behind this, right? Yeah. And the old Latin does sometimes preserve those kinds of traditions that are considered to be actually significant. Uh, but yeah, it's it's intriguing. It's puzzling. Um, even without that, scholars would have suggested that perhaps in Luke's source material that have been the case, because Elizabeth conceiving in her old age, a child who's like Samuel is this is a poem that resembles Hannah's prayer, right? In First uh, Samuel chapter two, right? And so it's based on that. And so we'd expect Elizabeth to be the one to utter this. It's interesting that in the infancy gospel of James, Mary's mother, who I argue is transformed Elizabeth, just she's almost on the cusp a couple of times of saying, she says, my my soul uh, is magnified, right? It's, it's about to go there and then it veers away. Um, and there's, that's one of many things. I there, there was a point at which I thought, maybe I need to stop thinking about this as a one big scholarly book. And do a series like um, John P. Meyer did on historical Jesus, called a marginal Jew. Do like a series on a marginal, a marginal precursor Jew, or something like that, or the mar proto marginal. I don't know what it would be called, right? <laughs> uh, what I realized that I thought about it is that on the one hand, each of these chapters could be a book length study in its own right and deserves that kind of level of detailed discussion. Mm -hmm. But I also realized that until I publish these books on the subject, nobody's going to want that. Right. There are a few exceptions. Right. And you might be one of them. Right. Where you'd be like, yeah, this whole series of books is interesting. Digging into the infancy stuff and doing. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. the time. But I hope that others will come along and the hopefully genuinely groundbreaking and innovative stuff that I've done in these books will lead others to dig into them in more detail. Maybe draw even more precise conclusions than I've managed to. I'm hoping this will be the start of a really vibrant period in the study of John the Baptist. I, I think so. I, I think it's going to be inspirational for, for a lot of uh, future scholars, for a lot of present scholars. So I think you've really given the world a gift with this research, James. So we should wrap up, unfortunately. Come back on in the fall. We'll, we'll talk about ancient Syriac. Uh, if people aren't into that, then they can put the show on before they go to bed. But knowing our audience, a lot of them will be will be into it. James, I have a, uh, an awesome... We were trying to figure this out before the show. Mary Baptist Miss, Mary John Miss. I hope you have your John Miss tree up in exchange your John Miss presence that, that you got the locust and wild honey that you want us uh, this year. So take care. <laughs> Thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been great talking with you. Great talking with you. Bye.